အလုံးမဲ့မင်္ဂလာပါအဲလက်စ်နိုစကူမှာကြိုးစားပါတယ်ဒီနေ့ကတော့လူအများစုမှတဲ့ကြတဲ့အာသိတလိုနဲ့မ
ตนายุไม้ตုံးเตนตုံးเนี่ยกิโลกรัมตะถาวชื่อเนี่ยกုံกายามองลาเลยสู้ตุ่ยเมมเมนต์ตะเปียวไหลตုံးเตอะเปีย
ที่ก็ชาวชาวเราเราว่าโอ้ยยืนยืนทุกอันนี้มีสูตรอะไรหลายๆนะแต่ถ้าเราโอ้ยเสียยืนยืนทุกอันแบบว่าถ้าเราเ
ตัวเนี่ยตัวเนี่ยตัวเนี่ยตัวเนี่ยตัวเนี่ยตัวเนี่ยตัวเนี่ยตัวเนี่ยตัวเนี่ยตัวเนี่ยตัวเนี่ย
You've learned how to implement exponentially weighted averages. There's one technical detail called bias correction that can make your computation of these averages more accurately. Let's see how that works. In the previous video, you saw this figure for beta equals 0.9 this figure for a beta equals 0.98. But it turns out that if you implement the formula as written here, you won't actually get the green curve when, uh, say, beta equals 0.98. You actually get the purple curve here. And you notice that the purple curve starts off really low. Uh, can I see the video that Alex got? Uh, how dare Molly scream a ball out? Molly scream share a Molly didn't know where Johnny is, did I? Video me out. Sorry, Josh, I like to. Ah, okay. Oh, so let's see how to fix that. When you're implementing a moving average, you initialize it with v0 equals 0, and then v1 is equal to 0.98 v0 plus 0.02 theta 1, but v0 is equal to 0, so that term just goes away. So v1 is just 0.02 times theta 1. So that's why if the first day's temperature is, um, say, 40 degrees Fahrenheit, then v1 will be 0 0.02 times 40, which is 8. So you get a you know, much lower value down here. So it's not a very good estimate of the first day's temperature. V2 will be 0 0.98 times V1 plus 0 0.02 times theta 2. And if you plug in you know, V1, which is this, down here, and multiply it out, then you find that V2 is actually equal to 0 0.98 times 0 0.02 times theta 1 plus 0 0.02 times theta 2. And that's 0 0.0196 theta 1 plus 0 0.02 theta 2. So again, you know, assuming theta 1 and theta 2 are positive numbers, when you uh, compute this, v2 will be much less than theta 1 or theta 2. So v2 isn't a very good estimate of you know, the first two days temperature of the year. So it turns out that there's a way to modify this estimate that makes it much better, that makes it more accurate, especially during this initial phase of your estimate, which is that instead of taking vt, take vt divided by 1 minus beta to the power of t, where t is the current day that you're on. So let's take a concrete example. When t is equal to 2, 1 minus beta to the power of t is um, 1 minus 0.98 squared. And it turns out that this is 0.0396. And so your estimate of the temperature on day 2 becomes v2 divided by 0 0.0396. And this is going to be 0 0.0196 times theta 1 plus 0 0.02 theta 2. You notice that these two things adds up to the denominator 0 0.0396. And so this becomes a weighted average of theta 1 and theta 2. And this removes this bias. So you notice that um, as t becomes large, beta to the t will become, will approach zero, which is why when t is large enough, the bias correction makes almost no difference. This is why when t is large, the purple line and the green line, you know, pretty much overlap. But during this initial phase of learning, when um, you're still warming up your estimates, when bias correction can help you to obtain a better estimate of the temperature. And it's this bias correction that helps you go from the purple line to the green line. So in machine learning, for most implementations of the exponentially weighted average, um, people don't often bother to implement bias correction because most people would rather just wait that initial period and have a slightly more bias estimate and then go from there. But if you are concerned about the bias during this initial phase, while your exponentially weighted moving average is still warming up, uh, then bias correction can help you get a better estimate early on. So that, you now know how to implement exponentially weighted moving averages. Let's go on and use this to build some better optimization algorithms. You've learned how to... Okay, wow. Well. Okay, well, let's start again, no? Okay, wow. Well.
tu se ha pio alba no se no di una in vagata ti che le vita average ne ne necessario de bono da me di vita average go va blu po bi con no blu mo accurate po pi a blu lo amne so pio alba e ni era so sa initial stigma bono so no bio correction ne sa lo line di value a po con alba ti lo lo di line ma ti ne a pio bono di a sei line so di vita average moving with average ga da warming up ti de che ma bo di a line con le อ่าปาเรอ่ามิสซิ่งอ่าแวลูอ่าเอราลี่ปาเรอเนาะเอราโอ่อ่าเจ้าปาเรสคอร์เรคชั่นเทไลซิงอ่ะเพียงพอเน
on each iteration, or more specifically, um, during iteration T, you would compute the usual derivatives dw, db, I'll omit the superscript square bracket Ls, but you compute dw, db on the current mini batch. And if you're using batch grade and descent, then you know the current mini batch would be just your whole batch. And this works as well off a of batch grade and descent. So if your current mini batch is your entire training set, this works fine as well. And then what you do is you compute v dw to be beta v dw plus one minus beta dw. So this is similar to when we were previously computing v theta equals beta v theta plus one minus beta theta t. Right? So it's computing moving average of the derivatives for w you're getting. And then you similarly compute v db equals that plus one minus beta times db. And then you would update your weights using w gets updated as w minus the learning rate times. Instead of updating it with dw, with the derivative, you would update it with v dw. And similarly, b uh, gets updated as b minus alpha times v db. So what this does is smooth out the steps of gradient descent. For example, let's say that the last few derivatives you computed were this, 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 this. If you average out these gradients, you find that the oscillations in the vertical direction will tend to average out to something closer to zero. So in the vertical direction, where you want to slow things down, this will um, average out positive and negative numbers. So the average should be closer to zero. Whereas on the horizontal direction, all the derivatives are pointing to the right in the horizontal direction. So the average in the horizontal direction will still be pretty big. So that's why with this algorithm, with a few iterations, um, you find that the gradient descent with momentum ends up eventually just taking steps that are much smaller oscillations in the vertical direction, but are more directed toward the horizontal, to just moving quickly in the horizontal direction. And so this allows your algorithm to you know, take a more straightforward path or less to damp out the oscillations in this path to the minimum. One intuition for this momentum, which works for some people and not for everyone, is that if you're trying to minimize you know, a bow shape function, right? this, this is really the contours of a bow, um, I guess I'm not very good at drawing, but if you're trying to minimize this type of bow shape function, then these derivative terms, you can think of as providing acceleration to a ball that you're rolling downhill. And these momentum terms, you can think of as representing the velocity. And so imagine that you have a bow and you take a ball and the derivative imparts acceleration to this little ball. It's a little ball that's rolling down this hill, right? And so it rolls faster and faster. Uh, because of acceleration. And beta, because this number is a little bit less than one, this plays a role of friction and it prevents your ball from you know, speeding up uh, without limit. But so rather than um, gradient descent, just taking every single step independently of all previous steps, now your little ball can roll downhill and gain momentum, but it can accelerate down this bow and therefore gain momentum. I find that this uh, ball rolling down the bow analogy, it seems to work for some people who enjoy physics intuitions, but it doesn't work for everyone. So if this analogy of a ball rolling down a bow doesn't work for you, don't worry about it. Finally, let's look at some details on how you implement this. Here's the algorithm. And so you now have two hyperparameters, uh, the learning rate alpha, as well as this parameter beta, which controls your exponentially weighted average. The most common value for beta is 0 0.9. We're averaging over the last 10 days temperature. So this is like averaging over the last 10 iterations gradients. And in practice, beta equals 0 0.9 works very well. Uh, feel free to try different values and do some hyperparameter search, but 0 0.9 appears to be a pretty robust value.
Well, and how about bias correction, right? So do you want to take VDW and VDB and divide it by one minus beta to the T? In practice, people don't usually do this because after just 10 iterations, your um, moving average will have warmed up and there's no longer a bias estimate. So in practice, I don't really see people uh, bothering with bias correction when implementing gradient descent or momentum. And of course, this process initialized with VDW equals zero. Note that this is a matrix of zeros with the same dimension as DW, which is the same dimension as W. And uh, VDB is also initialized to a vector of zeros with the same dimension as DB, which in turn has the same dimension as B. Finally, I just mentioned that if you read the literature on gradient descent with momentum, Often you see it with um, this term omitted, with this one minus beta term omitted. So you end up with VDW equals beta VDW plus DW. And the net effect of using this version in purple is that VDW ends up being scaled by a factor of one minus beta or really one over one minus beta. And so when you're performing these gradient descent updates, alpha just needs to change by a corresponding value of um, or one over one minus beta. In practice, both of these will work just fine. It just affects um, what's the best value of the learning rate alpha. But I find that this particular formulation is a little less intuitive because one impact of this is that if you end up tuning the hyperparameter beta, then this affects the scaling of VDW and VDB as well, and so you end up needing to retune the learning rate alpha as well, maybe. Um, so I personally prefer the formulation that I have written here on the left rather than leaving out the one minus beta term. But uh, so I tend to use the formula on the left, the printed formula with the one minus beta term. But for both versions, having beta equals 0 0.9 is a common choice of hyperparameter. It's just that alpha, the learning rate, will need to be tuned differently for these two different versions. So that's it for gradient descent with momentum. This will almost always work better than the straightforward gradient descent algorithm with momentum. But there's still other things we could do to speed up your learning algorithm. Let's continue talking about these in the next couple videos. Okay, bye. Oh. Oh. Uh, maybe I will see that. Do you want to see that? Mm, LS maybe or not? Oh. <laughs> ไอ้ตัวอกุณาอะไรตัวบอลลงเลยเอาเลยค่ะไอ้สบายอกุณาอกูเปียวอ่ะมันอกุณาอะไรสุดไทป์ปอนี่อยู่ตะกูปิดท
ဒီဒီဒဗလျူအဲ့အရင်အာကိုယ်ရဲ့အကိုယ်ကအကြောင်းလဲဒီဒဗလျူအထားနဲ့ဒီဒဗလျူအထခိုက်ချက်အကို
ဟုတ်ပါပြီအဲ့ဒါလေးမနက်မှန်တော့ကြအောင်လေနော်နည်းနည်းတို့ကမှာဆိုလို့ဒီနေ့မမန်တန်ကြောင်းလေမျိုး
ပြီးတော့ဒီကိုဒီကိုဒီကိုဒီကိုဒီကိုဒီကိုဒီကိုဒီကိုဒီကိုဒီကိုဒီကိုဒီကိုဒီကိုဒီကိုဒီကို